Good morning, or almost afternoon. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Vince. Um, I am very honored to be moderating this excellent panel. Um, I'm going to start with just quick introductions of everyone's name, and then I'm going to have everybody do a brief introduction of themselves and uh, ask about one thing that they are excited about expanding or kicking off in 2021. So first, I will ask, this is on my virtual right, um, Lauren Faber O'Connor from Mayor Garcetti's Chief Sustainability Office. Um, introduce yourself and let us know what you're excited about for 2021. Let you know what I'm excited about? Yes. Uh, well, other than this being a great couple of days <laughs> and seeing so much participation and interest, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and then it stretches far and wide in terms of the participation. But, but in the city of LA, hard, so hard to choose one thing because, you know, next year is going to be a year where we're seeing so many of the, for example, electric buses that we've ordered coming into the city and be, you know, put into use like that is so exciting to be seeing that move forward. We're going to be seeing the moving ahead with clean truck innovation and finance at the Port of Los Angeles, something I'll come on to later. But one thing I thought I would bring to light in this particular you know, piece of the conversation is our work around a zero emission area. And in part because I think we um, we were expecting a little bit more on the ground engagement on this issue at the beginning of this year. And so next year we're really energized to in any way, shape or form it needs to take. We all sort of understand better how to do community engagement. And so whether or not that's in person, um, there's real opportunity and momentum that has been built over the course of 2019 and 2020 to really build um, a vision around a zero emission area or multiple zero emission areas in the city of Los Angeles that we have already been working internally across all parts of the city family to understand what neighborhoods really have the opportunity for significant mode shift or zero emission uh, transportation adoption. Um, and the, the overlay with, um, you know, environmentally burdened communities at the same time, and that we've been able to use some of the, you know, um, most difficult burdens that we faced over the course of this year to help bring a renewed um, excitement around the use of public space yeah. in the city and how much people really do value open accessible space and what that can mean in terms of informing and gaining new constituencies for a focus around a zero emission area that helps reduce vehicle miles traveled, bring clean air to communities, accessible, clean transportation, and a better quality of life. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. And it shows the holistic lens that you know I share in being a sustainability colleague of, of Lauren. So um, I think that's so important in this transportation electrification conversation. Um, I'd like to have Commissioner Monahan um, go ahead and introduce herself and let us know one thing that you're excited about working or expanding on in 2021. Well, thanks, Kristen. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm Patty Monahan. I'm a commissioner at the California Energy Commission. And I do prefer Patty over commissioner because I okay. find commissioner just very strange. <laughs> I don't know why, it just does, uh, it's off-putting. Uh, so in terms of what I'm excited about, I got to say, I am super excited to have a president in the White House who believes in science, believes in California's authority to set vehicle standards, and believes in the need to electrify transportation. Um, you know, the governor has already made, uh, you know, put a, put a marker in the sand around, here's what we're doing in California. We are moving to a zero emission vehicle future. And um, and now to have a partner in the federal government is just you know, such a relief. And I think we'll be able to move forward as a state much more aggressively, both on uh, setting the right standards that incentivize the right investments by industry and the, the right set of incentives to support both the build out of the infrastructure for zero emission vehicles and the vehicles themselves. Excellent, thank you. Yes, that's um, a world of a difference and I think it gives us the opportunity to double down in a way that we all know needs to be taken. Um, 
And next, I'd like to bring up Matthew Nelson um, from Electrify America, their government uh, affairs director. And I told uh, Matthew ahead of time I was going to cancel him because he is um, with such powerhouse group of women. So I'm going to put you last to tell us about what you um, are excited about for 2021. And of course, so yeah, briefly introduce yourself. Thank you. And I think you told me that I have to keep up, which is uh, pretty impossible <laughs> with this group. So I'll just I'll just stay here as the caboose. Um, but uh, it, so first of all, uh, this is my first opportunity to to present or or participate in a, a transportation electrification partnership uh, event. So thank you for having me. Uh, have known about your great work for for a long time now, and of course, uh, even to a previous job, have known known the great work of Lacey generally. So. Uh, honored to be here today. Uh, it, it, many of you may already know, but just in case, uh, Electrify America is kind of the new kid on the block when it comes for, to charging. Uh, we opened our first uh, DC fast charging station in 2018, but we've grown up pretty quickly. We are now the largest network of, uh, of DC fast chargers, open network of DC fast chargers in the United States with 2,200 chargers at more than 520 sites. Uh, we strive to be a very open and very user-friendly uh, uh, network. Our our goal is to drive EV adoption. And so we feature uh, open networks with credit card readers, but also very advanced, very reliable technology. So uh, we, we refer to it as ultra-fast charging. And it's about it, stations have the capability of adding 20 miles of range per minute. Um, so I'm excited to speak with you all today, in, in part because Los Angeles is our largest market. Uh, so that's uh, that's in addition to being nationwide, uh, I have kind of a parochial local interest as well. Um, in 2021, what we're most excited about is we're going to go from 500 to 800 stations. So that's really going to enable. Uh, that's that's when you think about that. That's 300 stations in 365 days. That's really 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 hard but uh we we opened uh four stations a week last year and we think we can do it again next year um we're also really excited that we're going to be planning and then releasing our next plan for 500 million dollars of investment in this space including a big focus on the the key topics that were raised uh, all through the the last couple days uh the the need for uh, expanding out of the light duty space and, and serving communities and addressing some critical equity issues. Uh, those are really the, the focus of our investment. And so we're excited to uh, complete that plan and then roll it out and, and share it with the world. That'll, that'll guide our $500 million of investment between 2022 and 2024. So that's what we're excited about. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. I, spending money is a very exciting thing indeed in this space. <laughs> so to wrap up this question, I'm hearing Lauren talking about sort of transportation electrification as part of this bigger quality of life uh, perspective. Um, Patty speaking to, we now have federal leadership. That's the, That was our missing piece. And that's what California does best is, is take things on and then federal steps up and 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 uh, we work together to make things really push forward and then hearing from the, the broad community of, in this space about zero emission mobility and thinking about the mobility side not just uh, passenger vehicles I'm very heartened to hear that that's um, that's uh, really where I started my my career in the mobility space so um, very excited and then of course folding in equity across all these aspects um, so moving on to our next question, I want to ask each of you, um, what do you see as the most challenging obstacle that we collectively need to um, overcome together and thinking in sort of one or two year time scale, recognizing that 2020 was the most challenging year um, in a very long time, right? We, we've kind of come up um, with and learning more about ourselves and learning more about how we engage and, and uh, and a lot about ourselves as individuals and how resilient we are as individuals and as communities. Um, so thinking about all that uh, in the back of your head, what, what challenge can we overcome together um, the next uh, one or two years in transportation electrification? Um, and I'll start with Patty. Well, I, um, I have a lot of faith that the global market for electric vehicles and I'm um, you know battery electric vehicles I think are ahead of the game 
over, over fuel cells, but fuel cells are making progress too. And I think we'll really need fuel cells to step up in the medium and heavy duty space. But I, I do have faith on, on the battery electric side that, that the global investments are going the right direction. You know, we're gonna see a, a lot of new uh, battery electric vehicles coming to market, new fuel cell electric vehicles coming to market, especially in the medium and heavy duty space. So I'm, I, I feel more like, okay, in the next five-ish years, we're gonna see cost parity <clears throat> with a lot of battery electric vehicles. That's what the data is indicating. Which, which I gotta say, if you're in the clean transportation world, like I'm old, I've been doing this for a long time, and it's amazing. Like this is the, hands down, this is the best time for clean transportation in terms of opportunity. Um, the part that I, I feel more where we really got to work hard together, and I'm looking at Matt, actually, and Lauren and everybody, is, is how do we build out a ZEV infrastructure that meets the needs of the average driver and, and the um, you know, fleets and heavy duty vehicles, while also making sure that it supports our clean energy goals. So you know, the time of day, when you charge, how you charge really matters for the grid. And we need right. to we need to do this in a way that supports our clean grid goals. Um, you know, I've said in the past, I'll say it again. If we could, the amount of energy, solar energy that we curtail in the middle of the day, uh, if we could just plug in at that time, we have this like EV happy hour where we're basically running on solar, and it's great for the grid, great for the vehicle. You know, everybody's happy. But how do we set the right signals for that to happen? So I I and I I don't want to say it like oh do this it's more like we gotta we gotta we gotta all work together you know the government has to work with private companies utilities uh stakeholders to make sure that we have the right investments and that we can um barrier where people feel like oh i'll get an electric car but i can't charge it especially if i live in an apartment building so that's the challenge before us i think it's an opportunity but we all are going to have to work together and uh, you know, put our resources, both fiscal and mental resources to the challenge. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that the, and the collective, we, I think the tent is maybe what you're getting at. The tent needs to be a little bit bigger than who's been at the table so far. We need the energy grid folks. We need um, consumer preference people. Absolutely. That's, that's, um, thank you for that insight. Um, uh, Matthew, do you want to share uh, what you think we can work on together and overcome as a, as a big challenge? Certainly. Uh, so we have, to, to me, uh, the way I look about at this over the next two years is we have some, we have two huge gauntlets that have been thrown down. So on the EV deployment space, we have the governor's executive order that has said we're going to go 100% electric by 2020, 2035. And on the national space, we've got the uh, president-elect saying we're going to get 500,000 charging stations across the country uh, by 2030. Uh, and if you if you study those two goals, they're not perfectly aligned, but they're direction. Uh, and when I think about the next two years, I think about how do we lay the groundwork to make that feasible? How do we lay the groundwork to make that possible? How do we make lay the groundwork to make it economically viable? for the private sector to make the necessary investments to do that. And to us, that's a policy question. So we, if we get the policy right in the next two years, like, like uh, you could say the policy was gotten right um, for solar in 2007 and 2008, we can turn the next eight years into transformative. So solar deployment increased 20 fold between 2008 and 2016. Like that's doable. We can do the same thing. And to us, there are four areas that need to be gotten right. So the first is incentives at the federal level. Um, uh, the there's a there's a Stabenow bill on the EV side, and there's a Carper bill on the the um, on the infrastructure side that would establish the long term stable incentive regime to allow investment. Second, hugely important thing is utility rates. Um, uh, the demand charges are an existential threat to the EV charging business, and they are specifically an existential threat. Oh, looks like we have Transit, a going on. electric, and... It's a cliffhanger. 
<laughs> you know. There's one more policy we really need to fix. <laughs> we got to well, fix that Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> I guess so. Um, all right. Well, let's let's uh, put a pause there, and we'll kick it over to Lauren. So, what do you? I mean, hearing infrastructure across both of these um, so far. Um, Maybe. Okay. Maybe, maybe, you know, you know, minute, right? maybe he got a little intimidated by the powerful women that uh, <laughs> he just couldn't, he just like couldn't take it. <laughs> I know, I know, I, I but here we are. Me. I really did. I... <laughs> He'll be back. We want you back, Matt. <laughs> yeah. So, so, okay, when he comes back, he comes back, and I want to hear the other two that he was talking about. But, um, yeah, I think we're on to some common themes, and um you know patty you were talking about uh you know who's at the table and you know i would add community groups as well because we really are looking at for me when i think about one of the big challenges is adoption technology adoption and i will say that when we were developing la's green new deal a couple of years ago and this was all in the context of updating the you know landmark 2015 sustainable city plan updating it to be compliant with the paris climate agreement which had taken place after the plan and we were really looking at a we're going to give you some time back not to worry <laughs> <laughs> we were we were updating it really looking to a, a carbon budget um, economy wide that meant that regardless of the sector that you're in renewable energy efficiency now matt's messing with my connection here <laughs> i think i'm i think i'm getting a little bit <laughs> matt i'm gonna blame you <laughs> we still hear you um, really well lauren though so, so you're good you know what what was jaw dropping is good good what was jaw dropping um as we were doing this analysis was the adoption rates that we were looking at at all types of technologies whether these were lighting in buildings, um, you know, basic energy efficiency technologies, and certainly EV adoption. Um, and so, you know, while I think that, and I'm confident that, you know, price will come down and the infrastructure, the work that we're doing together on infrastructure, will be able to overcome those things. But, you know, being able to do that such that we meet the adoption rates that we need to meet in order to, you know, meet our greenhouse gas goals, I'll tell you that, in 2015, the, the difference of our goal of on-road uh, zero emission transportation between 2015 and our updated plan in 2019 was threefold. It was actually more than threefold. Uh, went from 35%, oh, I'm sorry, almost threefold. It went from 35% to 80%. Um, and that recognizes all of these things, that things are moving faster, that's all right in the good direction but also the, the need and, and the urgency. Um, and so when you, when you layer that urgency with where cities, states, companies are right now, which is dealing with an economic calamity, um, that's, I think, what worries me is that additional layer. Now I can absolutely turn this argument on its head and say, this is a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for the nexus with public health and the nexus with economic development um, and job creation. So again, it's overcomable, but it is a new unforeseen challenge. And I think the answer is really at these types of partnerships that TEP provides through unprecedented collaboration and filling in each other's gaps. Not one entity can do it all. We have to collaborate. No, that's so important. Um, when we were putting together the county sustainability plan, you know, the community group's voice, I think is so important because they're on, on the adoption point specifically, people are, we heard from community organizations that were not necessarily anti-solar, anti-EV charging, but I just know that my neighbor's rent went up after that happens there and on their property. So I'm afraid for what that means for me because of the rent, right? It's not the technology, but we need to have those conversations in place. We need the renter protection, you know, like thinking really big here is, is important. Um, and, and that's how we'll overcome obstacles is putting people like thinking about everybody's whole person and their whole household conditions um, in place. Um, so going back, um, Matthew, you were going to make two more points about policies you wanted to uh, recommend we tackle together. 
Certainly. I, I was talking about demand charges, so I imagine that there was some sort of unexpected <laughs> cutoff of power to the system here um, from uh, uh, conspiracy theory. A, a, a utility. Um, uh, but uh, the, I don't know how much of that I got through, but the point is demand charges really matter. Uh, if we don't get them right, it, you can't run charging stations uh, uh, in an economically sustainable manner. And these are really important to those who can't charge at home. Uh, for, for those with a with a 4,000 square foot house and a six car garage, they can just charge at home and it's no big deal. But for, for anybody that lives in an MUD or rents their home, they need to be able to charge in public if we expect 100% of the population to drive EVs. And that needs to be competitively priced. If, if we are charging $10 a gallon equivalent because we are paying $9 a gallon equivalent of demand charges, that's not really fair. Um, and, and that's a really important issue. Th uh, the next thing I wanted to just mention is uh, permitting. I, uh, this is a soapbox I've been on for a while, but it costs us 30% more to build a station in California. Um, that's, that's a big deal. That's 30% fewer stations that we build as a result with the same amount of money. Um, AB 1236 compliance in California is at 20%. If we can get that up to 80 or 90 or 100%, it's a complete game changer. And finally, I just wanted to put a word in for fuels policy. Uh, California has been a real leader here in the LCFS regime. If we could get a national LCFS or even just, just fix the existing enforcement of the existing law, um, if, if EPA processed the applications before it today under the renewable fuel standard to use electric renewable energy in cars. Uh, Oak Ridge National Lab has studied this and they say it will increase EV deployment by 7.3 million vehicles by 2030. That's the single largest opportunity for increasing EV adoption in the United States under current law that exists, full stop. It is the biggest opportunity, it is there for the taking it, it requires no change of statute, no change of regulation. It just requires processing some applications. So those are our uh, four items. Uh, again, uh, demand charges, permitting, fuels policy, and uh, getting the incentives right. And uh, thanks for letting me chat a little bit. Yeah, no, Twice. thank you. And I'm glad you were, we were able to get you back online. And you know, I think that the piece on um, having, doing some basic governance things right is important, but we also have these really complex things that are challenging our governance structures overall. So I'm, I always think about sort of the structural piece there. So um, thank you for raising both of those, those aspects. Um, I want to welcome Matt Peterson, um, our fearless leader, uh, Lacey CEO, to the table here. When you, when you were calling out for Matt, when he disappeared, I thought maybe you meant me. <laughs> Matt, uh, thought I'd give you a little can, help with this Power Women uh, panel yeah. here. It's, uh, we only, and we only want leaders. Matt's on the stage, only Matt. Yeah. Yes. Matt Power and email power. <laughs> That's <our> role, so. <laughs> exactly. Well, great. this has been a great panel. I, I had a follow-up question. First, just thank you, Lauren, for your leadership and the mayor's leadership. We couldn't have created TEP without you both. Patty, you've been an incredible ex officio member and uh, behind the scenes with us uh, at CC, so thank you. Uh, and Kristen for uh, your leadership um, and your Gary's leadership at the county and your board of supervisors. And Matt, welcome aboard. We're, we're really excited to have Electrify America as part of the team. Um, I, you know, some great conversation points. Obviously, you know, the adoption question uh, in sort of the mind boggling adoption rate that the, the Green New Deal versus the sustainable city plan, so that threefold. We, we, and the getting the charger chargers in the right place. You touched a little bit on equity, and Kristen, you didn't really get to talk about sort of the thing you're most excited about, so I wanted to throw the question back at you, and then I know equity is a big priority. I don't know if that's your answer. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer it, and it's about the 710. Um, you know, I, I was born right off the 710 freeway, um, you know, not on the, you know, in a hospital right around there. Um, and the communities around the 710, you know, that's sort of our, one of our ugliest environmental injustices um, here in LA. And nationally, you can, it's, a, it's a national scale problem because our goods go across this country. Um, and the goods, the, the communities along the 710 disproportionately bear that burden. And I, I think that I'm excited because communities along the 710 have been calling for zero emissions before 
you know, sort of the rest of us got on board. Um, and I want to recognize that, that um, sort of before the demonstration projects are really out there, before um, sort of the larger transportation space, I would say, especially in goods movement. Um, so I want to recognize that leadership for a long time. And I'm excited because 2021, I think with TEP, we have some real momentum to do concrete things on the ground there. And I know that's what Supervisor Han is, um, that's really why we're part of TEP, um, to be totally honest, you know, so I think of uh, the concrete, I think we're there. I think we're really there to make some um, actual changes along, uh, in, in the infrastructure piece, there's so many variables that I think are in a good place um, through our, our uh, the RFI work that was done um, last year. We're, we're really in a great place, so I want to thank you for for getting us there and the whole TEP team. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a, that's one we all have to work together on. Everybody at this on this panel for sure, and others. Uh, you know, I, I I think back, uh, and of course, the air pollution that you're you're saying is such a burden upon these communities along the 710 and other um, key goods movement ar arteries that go through the region. Um, when Lauren and I worked together, we my, one of the last things we worked on together when I was in the mayor's office was the joint declaration of the two mayors and getting the zero emissions commitment by 2035 in place. And now the governor's upped it statewide. And I want people to understand, he's not saying ending the tr sales of trucks for dredge trucks by 2035. He's, he's taking the ports of LA and Long Beach goals uh, in the cleaner action plan and the plan to be statewide, all zero emissions by 2035, all dredge trucks. And that's gonna take, you know, what we do along the 710 is gonna make possible getting to that, not just regional target, but the statewide target. Well, thank you all. Really uh, grateful for your leadership and being part of TEP and uh, for this excellent conversation.